Hello, Cedar Life Church. Good to have you joining us again on The Conversation. And it's my privilege to have with me today, Alan Meyer, who's the co-founder of Careforce Life Keys. Uh, great to have you with us, Alan. Thank you, you Andrew. It's a real privilege. You shared an outstanding message on the weekend with our online congregations on dangerous moments in fathering or a dangerous moment in fathering. Yeah. And I know um, I've certainly had some dangerous moments with my children and with my grandchildren too. And sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't get it right. But uh, yeah, they've shown me grace and I really appreciate that. And we learn as we go. And I think it is important that we learn as we go how to be better fathers and grandfathers and parents and people who are father figures or parental figures in life. So why do you think the way we father and parent is such an important issue today? Well, I think it's always been important. And uh, you go you go the entire uh, history of the Bible and the history of the human race, and you just simply track father-son relationships. And some of them are spelled out in greater detail in the scriptures, and some of them are spelled out in great detail in the newspapers. Hmm. But um, I guess for me, the, the profound significance was underlined sitting in a um, message, sitting in Hillsong one day and uh, realising as I was listening to leadership share their boldness and their vision and so on, that um, there was an area of my own heart that just felt like I was never up to the challenge of uh, leading a great church. And as they were, uh, as one of those speakers was sharing that day, I said to God, where does this guy get this stuff from? And the Holy Spirit gave me, it was like one after another, just a series of remembrances and a whole series of really significant leaders that had provoked me and inspired me in my life and the stories that I'd heard about their relationship with their father. Uh, one of them, for example, Matthew Barnett. I'd shared the platform with Matthew Barnett at Hillsong and the uh, the thing that stunned me about it, here's, here's a young man with such boldness and such breadth of vision. Where does he get that? Well, I've uh, had the, the opportunity to um, visit Tommy Barnett's church in Phoenix and hear him s s uh, share about his experiences of growing up in a home with a father who's, who was full of faith and in some ways way out in front of many of the, uh, the, the pastors of the denomination he was a part of. And Tommy, um, he, he, grew up on, um, he grew up in a home where he saw his father exemplify faith and character and he stood on his shoulders. Mm. And now I'm dealing with Matthew Barnett and he's grown up in a home watching his father do that. Now he's standing on his father's shoulders mm. and that's where I did some, some, some significant reflection, not only about the kind of home that I'd grown up in, because my home was a great home, but it was a middle-class home in which I never saw my father ever ex exercise any dramatic um, uh, stand in terms of faith. Although mine was, my dad was a very faithful man, I had never seen the kind of risk and the kind of faith uh, that these other men had had exemplified in their childhood. I grew up in a very safe home. And in fact, perhaps what um, underlined the degree to which my own dad had lived a life in which he kind of protected the safety of the home was when I actually resigned my teaching career and went into full-time ministry. My dad was so shocked by that, <laughs> he phoned up the education department and tried to get my job back. <laughs> he, he just felt it was an outrageous step. And, and yet my dad was a lay preacher, and I think my dad had a call to ministry in his own life. But he grew up during, uh, th you know, around two world wars. Um, he grew up through the Great Depression of the 1930s, and it left him with a sense of guarding things rather than being bold and out there. Uh, my dad lived a very secure and a very cautious life. His greatest whiskey ever took was marrying my mum and building a house, and he pulled those off brilliantly. Uh, but it meant I never grew up with an example of profound leadership. And then when I was faced with leadership, I had no shoulders to stand on. And that's when I looked back and thought how graciously God gave me an experience with a second father in uh, Hal Oxley. Fathering is profoundly important because it builds a foundation on which you have to live the rest of your life. So it really does have generational impact, the way we father and the way we lead, the way we take risks, the way we negotiate through life. 
has an impact on our children and really our children's children as well. Huge impact. Yeah. You talked in the message about that dangerous moment in fathering and that is the moment of discipline and correction and about the delicate balance there is between correction and affirmation. Why are both important in parenting? Well, both are important because uh, we need them both. Um, the reality is that, you know, as Hebrew says, you know, there are things, sometimes paths are crooked and sometimes um, knees are getting weak and there's a danger if someone doesn't correct, you're going to grow up uh, with a deformed, um, inadequate uh, structure to the whole way in which you're viewing life and doing life. And God delegates the res- those responsibilities to parents and one of the problems that parents face is that they carry that responsibility and they feel that responsibility. And one of the things you have to talk about is the fact that um, all of us are broken, not just our kids, but the parents are broken as well, Mm. which means that often when we feel that we have a responsibility, we may sometimes exercise that responsibility in an an inappropriate way. Uh, Our own experiences of shame, our own experiences of being shown up as an inadequate parent, our own experiences of not wanting to be a failure at this as well um, mean that sometimes we can over-parent in ways in which we use language, which is really unhelpful. Uh, Sometimes uh, a parent can use violence, um, and it's not that, uh, you know, the Bible does speak about uh, physical um, correction, but it's not intended to be the main form of correction. And when uh, parents, you know, fall into the the trap of thinking the only way that you can correct a kid is to beat the kid into shape, um, that whole mindset flows out of a broken parent's heart, feeling the responsibility to both correct and um, feeling that the role of correction is more desperate than the role of affirmation. And so often in a situation, particularly where parents are feeling the pressure of a difficult child, a child that is not easily compliant and they get terrified. Uh, and I think that's a part of what I experienced when I was growing up. It wasn't that I was a difficult child. I just kept getting into trouble. Um, you know, I, got, I, I, I stole stuff out of Coles and the manager rang up and told my mum when, when I was only nine years old. And, then, and that started a series of events in which I think my parents figured that I was probably headed to, to jail and uh, I'd get into trouble. I'd shoot Russell Simpson in the backside and the police would turn up at the front door or I'd burn the park down and the fire brigade would turn up. And then eventually, I mean, there were a whole series of events. I think my father, who was a deeply moral and upright man, feared so much that he, but that he didn't find room for affirmation. He just felt like there was an awful lot more correction he needed to do. But because both are important Uh, in the parental role, it's critical that we appreciate just how difficult getting that balance right can actually be, depending on the kid that you're uh, seeking to raise. So we can really overbalance towards correction as in with your father, or we can also overbalance the other way and not realise that we have a role in bringing structure and and bringing correction in a child's life. Exactly. And yeah. both of them, are, both of them are profoundly important, mm. and uh, and it's one of the reasons why it's so vital to, to realise. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. I'm so grateful to grow up, you know, to have grown up in a church environment where there was um, there were, were examples of fatherhood of, of significant, significantly different examples of fatherhood surrounding you all the time, and that becomes a, a really helpful mitigating factor when you're in a good church environment and. There are guys with different personalities who can not only model the different facets of fathering, but also support you in the kind of job you're trying to do yourself. Mm. So really, this is a message not just for biological fathers, but for all of us in community have a role in being an example, take, you know, fathering in community, being, bringing that uh, example to others. You gave some really great examples of practical ways we can strike that balance between affirmation and correction. And one of the ones I really liked was you talked about repair work, how there needs to be repair work when when correction is given. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that and why that's important? Yeah, because I I never saw it. And as a result, I had to kind of of discover this or stumble into it. 
um, there was never a single time when my father came back and did repair with me. And so what do you mean ways, by repair work? Just just give us a brief summary of what you mean by okay, that. Well, example. I'll give you an example. Um, in a, another message that I do in which I reflect deeply on the way in which I related to my dad, my dad had two different ways of, of kind of demonstrating to me that he was not happy with what I was doing and how I was living. One was he could go silent and kind of give me the kind of re- looks or reflection that said to me, I, there are no words, Alan. There are no words. And so silence is the only way I can communicate to you how unhappy I am. And the other way would be he'd blow up in my face and he would really get very, very noisy and sometimes give me a belting. Um, he never once, after those moments, came back to me and sat down and then did the coaching work. And the coaching work, I mean, for, you know, a coach on the football t- field may need to yell at a player at some point and say, you know, you've got get on your man. You know, you know, you, you should know how to play football. And he yell at him. But afterwards, he may go up to him and say, okay, mate, let's let's talk about that. I, I you know, I, I yelled at you, but um, there's a lot. Then you begin to coach, mate. You, you you've got it, but you mustn't leave. You mustn't let that happen. So you come back and you repair the relationship so that the guy doesn't go home with, a, with, with, with cuts and hurts and bruises from the kind of conversation you've had. He, he knows it's okay, we're all on the same team and the guy really loves me and he thinks I've got... That never happened with my dad. So never once did he ever come back and repair um, a, a, a moment of correction with a moment of affirmation. And one of the things we've got to appreciate is when you're dealing with a broken heart, a word of correction cannot be, cannot be counterbalanced with a word of affirmation because in a broken heart, we, we have a tendency to magnify mm. the negative and minimise the positive. Um, positives can be like water off a duck's back to a hurt kid or to a hurt heart. And it's the same is true in marriage. It's in, true in every relationship. But the reality is um, one word of uh, one negative word, one negative, one word of rebuke, one word that seems to say to us, you're a failure, you're, you're mucking it up, you're not doing it right, it stings. And a single word of saying, oh, mate, no, you did some good stuff, that does not take that away. Um, we, we have a tendency in our broken hearts to have a bias toward the negative. So you can hear... You can be surrounded by 20 people who love you and one guy hates you and that's the guy you'll wake up thinking about in the middle of the night. So true. One guy is making life hard for you, one guy's critical of you. You will not wake up in the middle of the night with a warm, fuzzy feeling because 19 people think I'm doing okay. That one guy's criticism will be like a burr, it'll be like salt in a wound um, because in our brokenness, our tendency is to be biased toward the negative, which means um, when my dad, for example, um, chewed me or gave me a huge belting once for buying, a mo- for buying a bicycle tube, had he come back afterwards and sat down with me an hour later or a day later and said, Al, we need to talk about what happened yesterday. Um, you bought a bicycle tube and I was really angry. How do you feel about that? And I would have said, oh, I don't think it was fair. I bought it with my own money. He said, well, now, let, let, let me explain to you how I felt about it. Let me, and we would have had a conversation and because I had no idea what the heck is going on with that man. You know, what is his problem? And he was probably saying, what the heck's going on with that boy? You know, w- w- what is he thinking? And so you've got two alienated people who don't understand each other's point of view, and that's why there's got to be a moment of repair. Because if there's no mo- ro- moment of repair, the two hearts begin to separate and communication ceases at that point. And that's what happens in marriage. Um, Mm. We don't understand what was that moment about? Why did you behave that way? Why did you treat me like that? And that never once happened with my dad. Now, I was on a holiday one time. My my eldest son, Matt, was um, 13 years old, and he had he'd become really difficult. And we were walking through this campsite, and I was kind of ticking him off, but not yelling at him, but I was kind of in his face a little bit, you know, what you met, you know, and, and, I, and he was walking alongside me, but he's clearly not listening to one word I was saying. And his whole body language was that of a, he was defending himself. And I stopped and I said, Matt, do you think I'm your enemy? And he said, yeah. Mm. And I realised we're 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 drawing apart here and i stopped and i said to him matt look at me maddie i'm probably the best friend you'll ever have in your life 
because I'm one man in this world. I would lay down my life for you, but And that was the first time I realized we're not, I'm trying to do the father thing here. I'm trying to do the correction, but he can't hear it. And the reason he can't hear it is because every word is hurting him. And as a result, instead of hearing me, he's defending his heart. And in order for hearts to communicate, hearts have to be able to open. Intimacy, intimacy is in to me see. And when hearts are wounded, they close. And I realized my kid um, is closing. Now, I'll tell you that one of the reasons that was so is because my first child was a compliant child. And the danger of having a compliant child is that you can give them a look. You can, you can say a word of rebuke and immediately they come into line. And after, as a result, you think, oh, I've got this parenting thing figured out. You know, I know how to be a good parent because I just look at her. I say, don't you do that? And she stops doing that. And I say, oh, they see that I'm doing a really good job because I'm helping her to walk in a straight line. But I had no idea what that did to her heart. I never went back and repaired those moments and say, sweetie, can we talk? I mean, how did you feel when daddy said that? Um, do you know that daddy loves you? Do you, do you, is it, we never had those. I didn't have to because she would draw into line. But with Matt, I'm dealing now with a different heart. And so I do exactly the same thing with the second child as I did with the first child. But instead of responding and coming into line, he, he, he fights me. He's taking me on. He's resisting me. And now, well, now I've been up the ante because I've got a parent. I'm, I'm a parent. I've got to help to control this kid. But I have no idea what these words are doing to him because instead of coming into line, he's got a different personality. He feels the hurt. And his response is not to come into line. His response is to defend himself. And now with every word of correction, I am driving him further and further into rebellion. And that's why these words of Paul, in um, both in Colossians and in Ephesians, become so flipping critical. Yeah. Don't Paul, provoke your children. Exactly. Yeah. Do not provoke. Oh, I love the way the Amplified puts it. Fathers, do not provoke or irritate or exasperate your children with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive. And I could have said, I'm not doing any of that. I said, from his perspective, you are. From his perspective, it feels like that for him. But if you don't do the moments of repair, you have no idea how that's actually landing for that child. And so you can you give yourself a tick for doing your parental responsibility, but no, you're not doing your parental responsibility because you've got to bring him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And the only way you can do that is if you do a moment of repair. And this is true in marriage too, because the reason that couples draw apart is because they don't understand why the other is behaving the way they are and they make assumptions, they draw conclusions and they think, well, the only way to fix this is to go harder and it's not to go harder, it's to do a moment of repair. And, that's and, it's, and it's, a, it's a bias towards repair, repair. I like the way you say that. I, I had a, a mentor of mine, uh, she has been involved in children's ministry for many years before she went to be with the Lord and she used to say 70% encouragement and 30% correction. Now, I don't know where she got the stats from on that. I'm, I'm not sure there's a study that shows that, but it does capture that same thought. It's same a bias towards the affirmation without discarding the correction. And the reason that often we don't feel like we can do that is because we think we haven't won yet. You know, I've got, I've got a responsibility to beat this kid into shape, to get him to walk in a straight line or her to walk in a straight line, to accept the truth, to take responsibility and so on. I feel I haven't got there yet, so I'm not going to affirm. And we withhold affirmation till we, we think we've finally got them, you know, sorted out. Well, now I can affirm. Now, the thing is, uh, that was the day I realised this kid's never going to hear me. Um, this little boy is closing his heart to me. He's doing this. And with every word of correction, I am um, damaging him further and I have got to find out, son, what are you hearing? What do you think I'm doing here? And I, I had a, a second experience with my second, with my second son, Luke, because um, I, I had him in a bedroom once doing exactly what my father used to do to me. He, my dad would get really angry. He would, he would straighten me out by being angry. And because I was respectful to my dad, I never once was disrespectful to him. Um, but I recoiled on the inside and I would just, on the, on the outside, I would straighten up and say, and, I, on, and on the inside too, so I've got to do better than this, but I didn't love him for it. I didn't feel close to him. And with every uh, amount, with every correction, I think I 
kind of drew further and further away from my dad in terms of loving him, which meant I never sought him out and I never sought his advice and I never looked for him to be a coach in my life because I didn't think I'd ever get it. And I had my, my second son in the bedroom and I was really chewing him out. But here again, he was a very different personality from the other two. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, Dad, you scare the hell out of us. I would never have said that to my father. Never once would I have even thought to utter that, but this kid will tell you exactly what he's thinking. Mm. And uh, he, um, the, 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 the older son would withdraw. This one will tell you exactly what he's thinking. And it shocked me so much because it was so different from what I would have ever said. I stopped and I said, well, son, I'm not trying to scare the hell out of you. I'm trying to be a good father. And he said, well, it isn't working. Mm. And we sat down on the floor and, and again, I, that, I did a moment of repair. I sat down on the floor with him and I said, sit down here with me. And I said, son, um, I think what's happening here is that I saw my father do this to me so often that I think I figured that this was the only way. And son, if all I'm doing is scaring the hell out of you, I'll say this to you right now, this will never happen again. I will never relate to you like this again. And I never did. Now, that meant that, meant that this, that young kid, he and I bonded like this. And it was only that moment of repair because he could have, I could have, you know, got big on him and told him, well, you don't talk to me like that. I'm your father and I brought you into the world and I'll take you out again. And I, I could have done the, the, the heavy deal, but we would never have been like this. And that moment of repair, again, underlined for me, Alan, stop repeating um, ineffective behaviour because you know how unhelpful this was for you with your own dad. Stop it. And I just what made I, What I really like about what you're saying there, Alan, is that it's not just repair work in terms of encouraging and speaking affirmation to the child. It's actually a learning process for the parent as well where you actually discover your own family of origin issues and then you've got to have the humility as you've demonstrated to actually re- recognise that you maybe haven't done that right, uh, right and listen to your child and rebuild. So you talked a bit about that in your message as well, about this whole thing of humbly seeking forgiveness from your children, of listening to them. Why is it so hard to do that? And how can we get better at that? It's a great question. But it all goes back to the fact that parents are as broken as their kids. And parents are affected by their family of origin as are their kids. And often we've had very little insight into that. And we've not, I don't think we've seen a lot of modelling of just totally transparent parenting. Um, I did see that with Hal Oxley. It was one of the things, one, you saw it with Kevin Connor too. Um, and, and these were two great men, men who were father, were father to me. I will never s- s- forget, uh, I was over there at City Life one day doing a Bible study on um, something or other with uh, Kevin and uh, dear old father Kevin talked about um, years earlier where he'd had to do correction with kids um, back in the USA where the, the Bible college where they'd been sleeping together and um, how they would do, go about doing correction. And right there in the middle of explaining how they did correction, he just started to cry. Tears running down his face. And you realised um, a father who can do really difficult correction but at the same time expose the heart that I, I hate this moment because I don't want to hurt you. But if I leave this unaddressed, I'll hurt you. And if I address it, I'll hurt you. But I'll address it and then we'll do repair. I'll, I'll coach you and say to you, I'll lay my life down for you. But I can't leave this unaddressed because it's too important. And you saw in, in, in Kevin that deep commitment to holiness but a commitment to holiness that is totally clothed in grace and kindness and desiring nothing but the best outcome and desiring nothing at the end of it, but that you know how loved you are and how um, we would love to, we want to surround you with protection and care, but we can't leave um, weak knees and crooked paths unaddressed. We just can't do that. Um, the, the dangerous moment is that in trying to connect the, correct the weak knees and the crooked paths, we just make things worse. 
Mm. And things get, as the Hebrews says, things get put out of joint rather than healed. That's why it's such a dangerous moment. And I think when doing repair, go ahead. So what steps do you think a parent and a, maybe a teenager, an adult child could take to bring healing when there's been that overbalance towards too much correction without the affirmation? Let me talk about first from the parent's perspective, um, repair. Here's the question I'm asking when I'm doing repair is how does the kid feel? What, is, what did he actually hear or she hear me say? Um, how did they feel? Because I know that there's a deep cry in every child and every adult for, for acceptance, for value, a deep sense of being valued and a deep sense of belonging. Um, there's, there's this longing and the correction may have damaged that. So I want to know, how did you feel? What did you think I was doing? What did you, what did you feel? Was, how did it impact you? How did it land for you? Um, how have you processed it? Because at the end of it all, you've got to know this. I am so for you. And like any good coach, coaches are saying, I'm not, I'm not correcting you because I think you're bad. I'm correcting you because I see the future. I see the potential. And, and if I can just help you make an adjustment here, you, you know, the sky's the limit. N nothing can separate you from the, the calling of God that's upon your life. And so coaching uh, is filled with a deep sense of value. The, I value you. There's so much in you that's worth working for. And as a result, you've got to ask a lot of questions. That's true in marriage too. We stop assuming. Stop assuming that you know how that landed for your kid and ask questions. And then when they answer, stop looking to immediately um, counter that. Listen to it and take it on board. Hear their hearts. Because if they see, that's one way you value a person is you see them and you hear them. And if you give a person a really good hearing and say, you know, I, I never saw it that way. Um, can you forgive me for not understanding your heart and not perceiving so, and that's where the. I think one of the one of the most healing elements in any relationship is a really good apology. And the problem with apologies that don't bring healing is that the apology was inadequate. You never, you didn't express in your your apology an insight to how it impacted them and how it felt for them and what it's done to them. And as a result, the, you, you apologize, but it doesn't land because you didn't demonstrate that you really see their heart, understand their heart and care about their heart. And as a result, you can't apologize well unless you have really listened to another person's heart. And if you can really listen and you can get it, then your apology has impact and it, and it lands and they can say thank you for that and i i appreciate it. i received that apology and now i can love you in return because i really understand you've removed the barriers uh, you understand what the, what the issues were for me and i thank you for being for making it possible for me to really get past it and because uh, we don't want to do leave stung, stumbling blocks um in in people's hearts and i think that uh, that's from a an adult perspective from a kid's about, perspective, yeah. What about from a kid's perspective? Well, even when even when really small children, uh, I don't want to raise children who are afraid to tell you what they're experiencing, because there'll be a day when you need to hear what they're experiencing. They won't do it. So don't try to raise silent dogs. Um, they can't. They can't. They they need to be helped to communicate appropriately and respectfully but do not jump on your kids for telling you the truth. Um, that would be the first thing. So kids have got to be helped to be able to say, it's okay to tell me how this is landing for you. That doesn't mean that they get everything they want, but they've got to be helped to do that. The more we grow, the greater the responsibility. One of the things that children often don't have the, the language, they don't have the capacity to go beyond the preverbal and the subverbal. Uh, trauma in people's lives uh, is hard to remove because it's pre-verbal and it's subverbal. It's it's deeper than language can be. They can't even find language for what's happening to them. Uh, so it's subverbal and it's also pre-verbal. Um, they haven't yet found a way to articulate it. 
And that's the one of the reasons why trauma is so often associated with childhood, because things happen that you don't understand. You can't fit them into your worldview. And because they're pre-verbal and subverbal, they stick. Now, the, the older we are, the more we have a worldview that's capable of processing um, injustice, tra uh, traumatic moments, and we can think them through and we've got a better capacity to allow them to be verbalized. And that's one of the things that can help you to process afterwards and kind of come to a place where instead of it impacting you for the rest of your life, you can get past it. Uh, with my own dad, I had an experience when I was in my 30s that turned me into a lover of my father. And it came because I was counselling a woman in my office. And it seemed like she had nothing good to say about her family of origin. And I said to her, have you ever done a treasure hunt on your family? And so we sat down and I said, I want you to tell me every good thing that ever happened in your family. And she said, oh, nothing. You know? And I said, no, come on, there's got to be something. And so she, as she thought of something, we would write it down. And the more she thought of positive experiences and good things that had happened in her family, the, big, the bigger the list got. And by the end, she realized that in many, she'd crossed all the good stuff off the list. That wasn't allowed to exist because there were some things I was unhappy about. That day, I had, an ins again, an insight into myself. And I realized that I'd done that with my dad, that I had, because there were things about him that were not helpful to me, and there weren't that many of them, um, that I minimized the good stuff. And I sat down and I wrote a list of the blessings that had come into my life through my father. And later that day, I wrote him a, a letter on church letterhead in which I acknowledged the stream of grace that had come into my life because of my father's character. And there was bundles of them. I sent him that letter. And, I, and the last thing I said on that letter was, Dad, whatever stability I have in my life, I owe that to you. And I sent that off to my dad. The funny thing was he never even mentioned that letter to me. He never even acknowledged that he received it. But years later, my mother said to me, the day he received that letter, he'd been grumpy for three days. And he was so excited by it, he wanted to go out and buy a picture frame, frame the letter and hang it up in the kitchen. And I said, well, you can't do that with a personal letter. You can't do that kind of thing. But he never mentioned it to me. But the, the fact is it totally changed my view of my father. Um, and out of it, I preached one of the most, probably the most important messages I carry called the parental paradox, in which I realized I've got to let the good things be as good as they really were. And when I did, I fell in love with my dad. Mm. Every time I met my dad after that, I would go up to my dad, I'd put my arms around him, and mwah, I'd kiss him right on the face. And he never knew what to do with that. But it didn't matter because uh, for me, I had done the repair. I realised what it, you, look, you can't be everything to everybody, Dad, and there's some things I wish that had been different in you, but you did the best you could. And as far as I'm concerned, 10 out of 10 for the good stuff. And for the bits that weren't perfect, if my, if God, if God was to mark my my iniquities, I won't stand either. And if my kids were to mark my iniquities, I won't stand. So I'm going to give my dad the same grace that I'm looking for from my children. And look, that worked for me. It it just changed my whole view. And for the rest of my life, I love my dad. And the, the repair work really is a responsibility on both sides of the of the relationship, both for Absolutely. the for the, and the older you get, the more responsibility we carry. Yes, that's right. Look, those are wonderful uh, principles, Alan, and wonderful stories to support it. You know, repair work with a bias towards affirmation, uh, taking responsibility to to with it with our children to really uh, encourage them to share how they're responding to the correction we're giving them, and then uh, having having a close enough relationship that. The repair work can be done later in life for because we all we all make mistakes. It is a dangerous moment being a parent, and uh, we we are fragile people. So I uh, really appreciate the principles you've shared with us. Really appreciate the your transparency with which you've shared as well. I think that will be helpful for people to understand the principles. What would you say to someone who wanted to know a little bit more about how to address these areas in their life? How how, how to become a better parent, better father. Uh, or to bring about repair in their relationship with their own parental figures? 
A really good book um, that covers this about as well as it can be, I think, is a book by Jeff Van Vonderen called Families Where Grace is in Place. Great title. Yeah. And uh, Jeff helped us launch Life Keys in uh, Melbourne back in 1994 when I was pastoring at uh, Mount Evelyn. And um, when we first rec- began to create the Careforce Life Keys courses, um, I met Jeff Van Vonderen at the end of that first year, which for me was a year of revelation. I was beginning to realise how deeply we need pastoral care, how all of us have been damaged by family of origin, how all of us carry stuff that we've never really understood well. Um, and if we did, it would just help us to do better relationships and live out the gospel in, in better ways. And I met Jeff Van Vonderen at a fuller seminary, uh, a fuller church growth conference. And uh, we invited him out in 1994, and he has some great books. And one of the books that I think spells this out really, really well is Families Where Grace is in Place. And uh, if, you, if you could use some help in terms of understanding how family of origin is impacting the way grace is being expressed in your household, that book will do it for you. Good. So Families Where Grace is in Place by Jeff. Van Vonderen. Jeff Van Vonderen. Thanks for that, Alan. Would you like to pray for us as a congregation? Pray for those listening. Uh, thanks for joining the conversation today. Mm. Yeah. Well, Father, what a privilege it is to have a Father in heaven who's expressed for us the value that we have in Christ, that Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has been gifted to us because of the value that you've placed on us in Christ. We thank you for amazing grace. Father, our hearts are so in need of healing and repair. I thank you for your Holy Spirit who's constantly reminding us of what Jesus has done for us. I pray that you'd help us to get um, to that place in our life. Help us to live at that place in our life where we're able to do both sides of this equation well, that we're not silent when we should speak, that we're not unaffirming when we need to rebuild and repair. And I pray for every father and every mother. I pray for every child that as they hear this stuff and contemplate these moments, realise that there's, there's a need in me. Lord, I pray, look upon their hearts with compassion and teach us how to walk with Jesus so that everybody can be healthier and uh, show forth the goodness that your kingdom has for us. I pray, Father, for the whole of the staff. I pray for the leadership. I pray for the small group leaders right throughout the whole of the city life campuses and i pray for great grace upon them as they discuss these issues and may some really good healing come out of it in jesus name amen